so hello everybody can you hear me i guess so so we are going to start uh the ods session so as you know uh just a quick uh reminder about how things will work so um the questions will be asked on slido uh just please select uh, ods number one uh, and tag the paper and uh, um, we will have eight papers uh, and one hour for this session and each paper has uh, five minutes to show the software and so uh, please be uh, concise and uh, leave the details for uh, the q a session and uh, and for uh more uh, uh, offline uh, uh, discussions, you can use Slack. Uh, then we can have at most one question per paper uh, in each round. So this is a list of papers uh, that we are going to deal in this session. So uh, as you know, this is uh, an open data set and software um, uh, track. And in, this, in the first day today, we're going to uh, uh, address uh, the open software and tools. And we have eight papers, as I mentioned. Uh, we will start from the first one. So each speaker uh, uh, will be able to uh, share his screen and uh, briefly present the tool uh, that, uh, um, the tool, okay? So the first paper uh, is by uh, Uyen Tran. Uh, it's about an open software for bitstream-based quality prediction uh, in adaptive uh, video streaming. So please, um, Huyen, you can uh, just uh, uh, share your screen and uh, begin your presentation. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I give some introduction about our software. So uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for introducing me. And uh, so, Edwin knows. Sorry, can you share your screen if you need? Uh, I don't need to say screen, so. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for introducing me. And uh, as we know, that network bandwidth fluctuates. So uh, video qualities may be dramatically varying during a streaming session. And uh, also, some story events may appear. They both cause negative impacts on user experience. Therefore, the key challenge in adaptive video streaming is how to evaluate the overall qualities of a section taking into account the impacts of quality variations and story events. And in this paper, we present an open software for bitstream based quality prediction in adaptive video streaming. And there are two key features of our software. First, the inputs of our software are bitstream based parameters, so it can be easily applied in practice. And second, uh, the inputs are on a segment basis, and we use long short term memory network to exploit the temporal relationships between impairment events. Experiment results so that uh, our software are performed for existing models, and uh, our software has been available on GitHub. Thank you. Okay, so. Um... Let me check the questions. Uh, just a moment. So, okay. Just a moment. So, the question is actually, uh, I'm posing the question. So, have you trained the model uh, on one specific segment length? And uh, how does this generalize to different uh, segment uh, lengths? So uh, thank you for the questions. It is uh, really interesting questions. Uh, as mentioned in the previous sections, 
uh, variable duration segments is uh, maybe future video streamings. In uh, this paper, we uh, just train our model for one second long segments. And uh, we have planned to test our model with uh, different uh, segment durations. In that case, uh, our solution is uh, each long segment is divided into multiple segments with a duration of one second. And so uh, our software can be applied for short segments. But uh, we will test our software for this case to make sure this solution will be good or not. So thank you. OK, so uh, the next uh, paper is, uh, by, is, is going to be presented by Ari. Uh, and uh, is uh, is going to talk about uh, the new feature of uh, the popular Quasar uh, encoder. Uh, so uh, please, uh, you can uh, share your screen if you want, and you can just uh, present uh, Quasar 2.0. Ari? Yeah, okay. thank, thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is Ari speaking. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, we have recently released Quasar 2.0, our practical open source HCVC encoder. In our paper, we present most of the encoder on a high level, focusing on the new intercoding functionalities and the very slow preset of Quasar. Red distortion optimization scheme mode decision process, early termination mechanisms, and parallelization strategies are discussed in the paper. According to our benchmarks, Quasar has become one of the leading open source HCVC encoders in practical high efficiency video coding. On a 22 core machine, compared to the reference encoder HM, Quasar is on average more than 100 times faster on the test configuration but still has competitive rate distortion performance. Okay, and now, uh, hope you, hopefully you can see the demonstration here. Unfortunately, I guess the animations are not so fluid. Uh, you... uh, thanks to the Zoom. <laughs> Sorry, uh, did you share your screen? Oh yeah, I just still need to click the share. Okay. I always okay. forget this. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, I hope you can see it now. Yes, we can. Yep. Uh, okay, so uh, typically during the encoding process, there would just be text output on a command line. But uh, fortunately, we have prepared something a bit more interesting this time. Uh, what you see now is a real-time visualization of the Quasar encoding process. Let me explain what is going on. Uh, in HCVC, video is divided to blocks that are encoded. The biggest blocks are called coding tree units. They can be recursively subdivided into smaller blocks. Uh, one of the most important tasks of an encoder like Quasar is to find a uh, good block structure. Uh, you can actually see uh, the depth first search in action here. Uh, first, there are smaller blocks, but if a bigger block has better rate distortion cost, it is chosen instead. And generally speaking, larger blocks perform better in regions with little detail, whereas small blocks are better for complex areas. Uh, about the colors, uh, color here tells the frame where the processed block belongs to. Quasar implements wavefront parallel processing, so you can see multiple block rows of the same frame being encoded simultaneously. Because information from the upper blocks are needed for encoding, bottom rows have a slight delay. But that's not all. Uh, as you can hopefully see, there are several different colored blocks being worked on at the same time, meaning there is also frame level parallelism uh, this is called overlapped wavefront. 
it allows even more parallel encoding, which is useful with a CPU with high core count. Then there are these symbols. Uh, they are the intracoded blocks. Y symbol is for the planar mode, X is for the DC mode, and the white lines with angles are for angular intra modes. Uh, typically, they are only present on intra frames or when previously unseen content is introduced. And the lines with color are motion vectors for intercoded blocks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for this interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so we have, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, regarding, so this is paper two. So we have uh, some questions. Uh, unfortunately, we, we will have just uh, time for the, the just one question and you can take offline the other ones. So Jean uh, say, says, great job. Does the new version support layered HEVC and motion constraint type enhancements? Okay, uh, th thanks for the question. Uh, so I guess uh, layered HCVC is about the uh, scalable extension for HCVC. Uh, it is not included in the 2.0 version, but we do have in fact a separate branch for scalable HCVC. Uh, I think uh, spatial scalability and SNR scalabilities are supported, so it is not quite uh, up to date uh, compared to 2.0 Quasar, but it, it's not far far from that. And about the uh, motion constraint tiles, yes, uh, we have support for this feature in uh, Quasar 2.0, but uh, there was slight problems with the tagged version, so uh, be sure to use the up to date commit from GitHub, so it actually don't have any artifacts. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so I will now switch uh, to the next uh, talk. Let me share my screen again. Okay, so the third paper is going to be delivered by uh, Jean Lefebvre from uh, Tele uh, Telecom Paris. Uh, and it's uh, entitled uh, GPAC filters. So please, Jean, uh, you can uh, take now, uh, you can share your screen if you want uh, to present. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm quite happy to, to present this because it's been a long work going on for almost three years. And let me share, share my screen. So, um, there we go. So I'm going to try to give you a, a quick summary of what is in the paper. And the paper itself is a summary of what we've been doing for years. We've been uh, completely uh, changing the architecture of, uh, of GPAC. So uh, as you know, GPAC is a multimedia streaming uh, framework with support for interactive media and composite rendering of 2D and 3D graphics. And we've, in doing so, we've been, actually, I wanted to share only one slide. That was also an opportunity to improve uh, testing and coverage and making GPAC much more reliable. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been working a lot on stabilizing the platform. There's obviously always work going on, but it's now much more uh, reliable. So as a quick uh, introduction, uh, let's see what we have here. So I have a bunch of files here. Uh, the first thing we've been introducing, uh, I would take this nice uh, clip here from Norde, uh, was an, a quick inspector filter. So we have a new app, which is called GPAC, which allows us to build filter graphs. So this one is just take an input and inspect it. And as you see, the result of this is a bunch of information on your media. And we've been also having fun with doing some 
analyzing. So that means that you can take any source. I'm still keeping it an MP4, but it can be pretty much anything you want. Oops, sorry. Uh, I don't see the end of, uh, of my screen. Okay, so here you have the basic uh, property of the media, so you you end up with the SPS PPS that is dumped for AVC, HVC, if you want. Uh, and if you want to go even deeper, you can ask for packet inspection, and you end up with the complete layout of uh, your media. So that's just one uh, small example here. Uh, another thing is we've been adding various filters, such as uh, if I take this one. Um, we call that a refresh. Say only keep. I don't know if you see exactly the end of the screen. Is that fine, or should I? Okay, and we're gonna say keep only the saps from this stuff, and I'll do a nice uh, irap.mp4. And now, if I ask FFM play to play this, you're gonna have a very nice. I wrap on me, so all of the frames are being discarded. That's kind of convenient when you're doing dashing. Speaking of dashing, so you all know, I guess, MP4 box. Uh, let's say that I want to dash my nice uh, presentation. You used to do something like that. I want a profile that is on demand. And I want to output this in, for example, dash. There's nothing there. So it's not live, but that's OK. Live.mpd up, and then you had this, right? But now you can just do, oh, by the way, I would like to have also MQ8. And you have now your generation of both the MPD and the HLS version. If I go with FF play uh, and ask him to play the M3 U8, he should be happy. It is very cool. Um, another nice thing we've been working on uh, is the, the ability to extract the composition engine from the player and run in a filter chain. So a good example of that is I take my nice uh, input, it should have here something, and redirect that through what I called a, I don't know if you see the mouse, uh, it's called the demo uh, MMC's JavaScript. So we're basically building a JavaScript filter that get, gets packet, in this case, decompress video and do some injection of graphics directly on the world frame and then encodes and uh, play that as an mp4 oh, there we go you're going to see the result is excellent obviously <laughs> take some time it takes some time because i'm also encoding with zoom the video so <laughs> and there you go Oof. and you can see the nice graphics so that's just an image but we're just cutting in um if you look at the, the logo of mnc i'm playing it again we're just cutting an ellipse into a rectangle and we're rasterizing the entire texture over this path which is a rectangle and a hole inside and the second uh, the ellipse is actually the input source that is used to blend over itself to produce this uh, very strange result so everything is done here without any uh yuv uh copy uh, and another thing we've been working on i will stop after this guy is uh, we've been working a lot on our input output. So in this case here, I'm going to redirect the output to a built-in GPAC HTTP server. And uh, that is going to tell me what. So I'm going to call it live.mp4. And I'm going to say, you want to have a storage mode which is fragmented, for example, and wait for the first connection because I don't have too many hands. So I need to pay attention to that, copying the URL. There we go. And if I open Firefox or Chrome or whatever you want and go for that, oh, you should have a load, hopefully. And there you go. So everything is done live here. So the entire chain can be customized in pretty much any way you want. We have HTTP put output, put output. Uh, we have uh, um, local servers, we have low latency servers, RTP, and so on. So all the examples I just showed, uh, they come from our test suite. So you feel free to check them out and, and play with that. There's a bunch of features uh, and we welcome the community to play with them and really have fun with this uh, new version of uh, GPAC. Thanks. Thanks, great, great demonstration. Um, so uh, I just, I will, uh, can you stop sharing? Thanks. Yep, sorry. Uh, wait a moment. 
Okay. So um, the que we have one question for you uh, by Emmanuel. Uh, what are the plans of GPAC regarding new HTTP version and network protocols such as QUIC? Okay, that, uh, that's a very good question. The plan is we are going to work on it. Uh, it's not going to happen in the next uh, in the next month. Uh, we are currently reviewing the, the best candidates, let's say, uh, to upgrade our HTTP stack and move to, I think we will move directly to HTTP 3. Uh, it's likely that we won't have an HTTP 2, but it really depends on the candidates we have. We won't de be developing that uh, ourselves because that's a lot of work. I don't think we'll have the resources for that. Great. But it's planned. <laughs> so just one, one uh, another quick question by Ali. Uh, can I convert a raw, low resolution video to 4K or even 8K with GPAC filters? Yeah, so the, the way it works, we currently have two uh, two possible flows, let's say, you can go uh, fully software, in which case for now, we have our own rasterizer, which might not give you an extra good quality, let's say, or uh, FFmpeg upscalers, okay? And on the other side, we have um, OpenGL upscalers. So we have, you can plug in an OpenGL filter quite easily and uh, do the uh, upscaling through OpenGL. Obviously, you will only get the results uh, of the GPU, but if you want, you can always plug in new filters because it's a plug-in system. So you can design your own filter to uh, intercept the packets you want and do the scaling as well yourself. Great, thank you very much. So uh, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so the next uh, speaker is Roberto Ramos Chavez from Unified Streaming, and he is going to present uh, uh, a tool for load generation uh, for evaluation of video streaming workflows in the cloud. So Roberto, you can also share your screen. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Well, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. In, um, uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, my name is Roberto Ramos Chavez, as Lucas said. I am a streaming engineer at the Unify Streaming. Uh, it's a streaming solutions um, uh, company based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And first, I'm pleased to be participating in this conference. So with further ado, I will briefly introduce our paper and try to answer any questions that may come up. So uh, yeah, what's our contribution? We uh, have three main. Uh, we present an extension of an open source web application load testing tool known, uh, known as Locus. So we have essentially extended Locus functionality to include uh, for streaming load generation of MPEG dash and HLS. And we have focused on this contribution on the use case of live streaming and video on demand. So part of the motivation and also challenges uh, that we have seen in over the top uh, uh, and broadcasters, uh, we, we have seen that there's still uh, a big challenge for uh, deploying video streaming at scale. And also, um, second, that it attribute to the increased complexity when using and testing video streaming workflows. And third, uh, of the constraints that we have seen uh, in the past years is the limitations in guaranteeing performance and scaling and, uh, ability in prime time events. So, um, what a little bit uh, of the tool itself and some of the uh, load generation scenarios that we uh, added in this contribution. So the tool aims to help identify some uh, problems as segment availability, a runness configuration that can, this can be on the workflow itself or also on the client side, on the client side, and uh, scalability issues that could be at the at the cloud infrastructure. And uh, we have focused on these three load generation scenarios. That is the step increase of users, uh, such as, uh, for example, a live stream when, um, when users join abruptly. And for BOD, it could be um, watching hot content in a, a specific release date. Uh, the second load generation scenario is a gradual increase of users. And also we added as um, a stability testing over extended periods uh, for um, to understand the behavior of the uh, media workflow 
but also on the client side. So uh, what actually the tool, the tool allows you to do. So it produces a mixed HLS and MPEG dash users emulation with radio assignment. Um, we added a specific uh, buffer. So you can see um, the behavior in, in different scenarios for a, a startup playback at the, at the client side. Uh, a large scale testing due to this distributed, distributed architecture library. So you can actually run the software in different nodes. Uh, it could be uh, in the same cloud or even a hybrid cloud. So it, it's really flexible. And of course, uh, we provide a, a couple of quantifiable uh, observations through common metrics at the client side, such as the number of requests, failed requests for each media segment, and uh, some other statistics that um, I will kindly invite you to look at the paper for a complete list. And uh, finally, uh, what the tool um, can uh, configure, how, how can it can be configured uh, for um, only requesting the manifest or specific uh, bit rate qualities. And also we added a small time shift in live use cases when um, we would like to load, uh, the, create a load close to the edge cases or far away from the edge and see how, um, how, how is the performance of this uh, video streaming uh, workflow. So uh, just a couple of notes and future work, it will be um, just to, we plan to identify different breaking, breaking point detection and a guarantee performance of each uh, video streaming setup. And as I mentioned before, I invite you to read the paper that gives more detail on different ways to configure this tool. So yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel, uh, feel free to send me an email, okay? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me give, let me, okay. So there is one question uh, from Ali again. Can broadcaster OTT providers create test scenarios themselves for this tool? Yeah, of course, the, this is an open source uh, software tool. It can be also extended in a Docker container to, um, to be using a microservice architecture. So yes, indeed, it, it can be used by any uh, broadcasters or uh, over-the-top media services. Follow-up question by Ali. Maybe you should also run a competition for users to crash the tool. It would be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I will uh, now switch, uh, wait a second, okay, here it is. So we move now to paper number five. Uh, it's going to be uh, presented by Mario. Um, and uh, the title of the paper is Open Source Software Tools for Measuring Resource Consumption and Dash Metrics. So please, yes. uh, Mario, you can share your screen. We can see you. Okay. Great. So thank you for the introduction. Basically, let me put presentation mode. It's not loading. You can see the presentation, right? Yes, it's working. So basically, uh, we don't want to, to focus on the technical details of the software we have developed and presented in this paper. And also demo videos are available on the GitHub. You can see the GitHub, uh, the link of the GitHub at the end of the slide. Basically, we want to talk a little bit about the motivation of why we developed these tools. And basically it's because we are developing tools for uh, virtual reality social VR technology in which we are developing Unity based uh, players. And we also are also presented, uh, developing a MCU for point cloud uh, volumetric representation of users. And we wanted to measure how much resources are consumed when mixing volumetric media in Unity and mixing different types of, of media 
or media elements, different, for example, like video billboards or 3D scenarios or different kinds of, of videos. So this is on the one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, we are also developing web-based players in which, uh, and, and also the Unity player in which we, this, this tool receive dice streams. And we wanted to develop a tool in which we can actually measure quality of service and quality of experience metric. So we focus on the quality of service metrics uh, or on the resources consumption metrics, sorry. If we're using Windows, we most of the time rely on the, on the task manager, but this is not very convenient because it requires manual annotation or, or, or the use of OCR tools. And of course, if we are developing an open source tool, we can extend the, to, the tool to measure this metrics, but this is not always wanted or uh, it's not always possible. So we decided to develop this tool and the other one, is of course if we are using DiceGS or we are using tool powerful tools like Bitmobile Analytics, we can measure uh, quality of service metrics for Dice for the Dice streams. But many times we are also forced to use third-party players. Or for example, when using Unity and we are embedding a Dice stream in Unity, we have no way to measure these metrics. So we decided to to develop a, a tool which runs in combination with Wireshark or T-Shark, which is the the console-based uh, version of, of Wireshark to to measure this metrics. So basically both tools are console based and they have been developed by using Microsoft Studio and C Sharp. And one, the, the two tools rely on the use of the Windows PowerShell and the second one, the Dutch quality metrics also requires T Sharp to be installed. Of course, we are using Wireshark or T Sharp to monitor traffic. So they are valid at this point for non-secure HTTP based com uh, communications. Of course, if the, the traffic is encrypted, we have no way to, to monitor it. And the first tool, which is the measure and resource consumption metrics measurement, uh, mean, monitors the CPU usage, the GPU usage, and the RAM usage. Also, a new version that is available on GitHub consume, uh, also measures how much bandwidth consumption is using a specific Windows uh, process ID. And then you can measure some statistics like the maximum, minimum, and, and average values. And these values are shown on the console, but are also stored in, in log files. I'm not going to explain the specific steps. If you are interested, please check the, the paper or watch the demo videos. Or also in the GitHub, there are more longer demo videos. This is just an example of the metrics that are provided in the console. And in the second one is the, the, the tool that actually measures quality of service and quality of experience related metrics for dash uh, for dash streams independently of the player you are using so basically you are you only need to indicate the the, the url of the mpd if you know it or the process uh, id of the of the of the application uh, in which the player run and it automatically captures the mpd and then for each one of the dice chunks or segments, it captures the URL, and this can be used later to uh, map this URL with the characteristics of the adaptation set of the rep or the representation in, in the MPD. Also very interesting for us, it measures the run trip time since you since the HTTP request and until you have received or downloaded all the all the TCP segments related to a, a chunk. And of course, also the, the TCP segments count and length and the effective bandwidth. So this is again is the steps that you need to, to follow to run this application. This is provided in the paper. And basically, yeah, as, as mentioned at the beginning, we are using this players, uh, these tools to uh, in the development of a point cloud MCU that we will be presenting tomorrow in, in NOSDA, for example. And we were using this at to know how much resources the point cloud MCU is using and how much resources the, the, the Unity player is using when playing the, the streams with and without the use of the MCU. And we are also using these metrics. We have developed uh, a 360 web-based player with an accessibility layer in which we, we combine different streams for subtitles, audio description, and sign language. And we were very interested in knowing how much resources uh, are needed when adding all these kinds of functionalities. So that is basically all. Here you have our contacts, so feel free to, to get in touch with us. And if you need the tools, of course, feel free to download them. And we are also very happy to discuss about these tools and how to improve and extend them.
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any question, of course. The presentation. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, what is it? Here. So, uh, one question from uh, Ali again. How do you deal with the tethering? Uh, like uh, air pay, airplay or phone HDMI TV type of scenarios. Are the measurements still accurate representative in such cases? Did you hear my question? Mario? Mario? Luca, sorry, but I had my, my laptop oh. muted. So probably you were talking to me and I didn't realize at all. Okay. I don't know. Probably I pressed the mute button okay. without. <laughs> yes. So should I ask again the question? Yes, please, because okay. yeah. I had okay. The... So Ali asked, uh, how do you deal with the tethering, like AirPlay or phone, HDMI to TV uh, type of scenarios? Are the measurements still accurate? or representative in such cases? I guess Ali is referring to the end-to-end -end delays. And of course, we're uh, measuring the delays at the network layer. We're not dealing with the, with the rendering stages. So we are measuring the delay signs. You send an HTTP get and until you download, until the, the segments are fed into the player. So we are not taking into account this, this the steps of the end-to-end -end chain. Okay. So Mario, let me clarify my question. Uh, yes. the, 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 the the decoder, the player uh, is on the device, but then actually the display is in it in other device where uh, there is still some delay, right? I mean, when I do airplay, I mean, I see a you know noticeable delay. So now, if I use a replication, I suppose uh, I will measure the delay all the way to the phone, not the TV, correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And Ali, there are other tools that can actually measure this, like uh, Video Lab, developed by CWI, that can actually measure this. But this, this was not the goal of our tool. OK. Thank you for the question. Thank so you. Another, another question, thanks. Another question from uh, uh, Abdelak. Uh, how easy to integrate uh, different QoE models? Uh, what if uh, we have multiple players running on various VMs on the same machine? Regarding the Q, Q quality of experience models, we haven't tested on it, and, but this is one of the, of the motivation of developing these tools. Because if you are able to measure these metrics when using different, for example, ABR strategies, then you can, now, you, you can fit the data you collect to automatically infer the quality of experience. That was one of the goals, one of the projects we have just started out at our university, and that's one of the goals or the motivations behind developing this tool. So how easy is to integrate? This is something that we want to, to investigate. We have started by just collecting the quality of service metrics, and then we will see how, how to do this. But of course, this is a, a very interesting uh, research task in the future. And if you have multiple players, it, if it each fetch player is run in a Windows process ID. You can run the two, the program multiple times, H1 for each Windows process ID. OK. Thank you very much. Um, I Thank think you. That if there are any other questions, you can pose them on Slack. So um, back on, wait a moment, I'm losing control. Okay, new share. Okay. Okay, so sixth paper, Tools for Live CMF Ingest, is going to be presented by Rufael Mecuria uh, from Univi Unified Streaming again. A lot of contributions from Unified Streaming. So are you there, Rufael? You're here, but uh, yeah, I can see you. What? Yes. So okay. I you to unmute. Okay. 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 So you can also share your screen if you need. Yes, I, I didn't think of that, but I have a presentation here. Uh, so how many minutes do I have? Uh, 
uh, let's say four minutes. We're getting yeah. a little bit. Uh, yeah. So I will just I'll just give a brief summary of our contribution, and uh, I invite everybody to check at least the slides, and if you are more interested, also to check the video. Um, so this contribution basically presents some open source tool to implement uh, CMAF Live Ingest. So in, over the last year and a half, um, the Unified Streaming has led an industry initiative to basically standardize the output of, of live encoders or perhaps even mobile devices to use the CMAF and HTTP post. So it's basically an uplink protocol for, for using CMAF, like, like fragmented MP4 segments. But basically this specification writes down like um, the exact error handling in case there is a failure, uh, redundant encoder ingest, metadata ingest, uh, signaling splice information to enable ad insertion and downstream um, and several other uh, features. And it mainly centers around the use of CMAP, which is a new, uh, well, relatively new uh, industry standard, uh, mainly sort of uh, promoted by Apple and, uh, and uh, Microsoft, but it's more and more uh, adopted. So, so you can use CMAP both in, in, in HLS and in Dash. So it's becoming a popular format and it's basically an, an, an ISO BMFF format. So it's basically just a fragmented ISO BMFF MP4 format, but it has some additional constraint on the media profiles, what, what uh, flags to set, what bits to set, to make sure that it plays on, on different devices, including Apple devices, uh, Samsung devices, Dash devices. In any case, we took this specification and we brought it to the Dash industry forum where there were several stakeholders, including cloud computing company like Microsoft, Azure, um, but also CDNs like Akamai. We, we, we involved some of the commercial media encoder like Media Excel, um, Harmonic, um, uh, and several others like Elemental was involved. So AWS Elemental, which is one of the popular um, commercial uh, encoder vendors. And basically we came together to sort of write down like how does an encoder or a source push FMP4 content instead of the pooling, which happens with Dash and HLS, it's about pushing content and using HTTP post. Anyway, that's a brief sort of summary of like, like what's in there. And the specification got published in the, in the Q1 of this year. It's a Dash IF technical specification. Last year, I also presented about this in Mile High video workshop and in the, the DMUXT conference, which are basically engineering conferences. But in this contribution, just to come to the point, we present some tools where you can basically take some SEMA files that are stored on disk and push them by using the protocol to a receiver. So we have a, both a pusher, which is basically a source emulator and a receiver emulator, which basically stores the segments and when you are receiving CMAF segments, you basically you can append the segment by segment and still have a valid CMAF track. And then you can do on the fly packaging and so on. So basically we have a sender, a receiver. Uh, we also have some tools to create metadata tracks. So the specification uses a separate CMAF track to send the metadata, but as this metadata format is not yet very well adopted, we included some tools to basically go from MPD events to metadata track or from in-band event to, to metadata track. Um, so that's included. And then we tested a few use cases. So one of them was low latency live streaming, where we basically use the sender to push to, to uh, um, a receiver that is doing the on-the-fly packaging and setting some latency configurations. So we showed that we can get a, a low latency using that. And another use case was edge computing, where we basically use the CMAF ingest to push from a centralized cloud to an edge cloud so we basically use CMAP as an intermediate sort of mezzanine format, while at the edge we generate sort of the, the, the encrypted formats and on the fly generated formats. So that also showed that you can basically save on your, um, your cloud egress. So basically the, the traffic between the centralized cloud and the edge cloud is reduced. Also it's more smooth. So you have less peakiness you know, compared to using uh, the edge only as a, as a reverse proxy, which is, which is how we commonly use it. Um, and then we also show that you can reduce the size of your, your caching at the edge. Um, yeah, so there are some C++ tools in there, so they don't really use any dependencies except um, libc URL. Uh, that's for the sender, C++ based. Um, and then we also include like a CMAF presentation, which include five subtitle, WebVTT, uh, some metadata, track, 
uh, and very well conditioned chunk CMAF content. So both two video contents, ABC, uh, one audio track, AAC, uh, that, that's all included. So you can basically, you can emulate a live uh, setup uh, with, the, with these tools. Um, and did I forget anything about the contribution? Um, well, it's available and yeah, you can check it out if you're, if you're interested or drop me an, an email. So did I reach my four minutes? Probably I did, but um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have one question. Let me uh, get the screen. Can you see it? So Jean asks, nice job. Can you further comment on Dash event message box? Not good for fast processing muxing. So it's a very specific question. I, yeah, well, I, I can answer that because we okay. also created uh, this, this metadata track is currently an ongoing activity in the file format group in MPEG to have this event message track format where instead we, we store the event messages like a, like a subtitle track basically. So we put in samples. So the reason is if we receive a, a CMAF track with in-band events, how do we know where the event messages are? So we have to scan the entire track to find the event messages. So they don't have their own timeline. They, they could be very far ahead or very far, um, uh, so very far in the past. Uh, so we have to scan the entire sort of track to, to find them. So that's why we consider them not appropriate for, for, uh, for true real-time processing and uh, for large scale fast on the fly packaging. So maybe John, you had a different experience with that, but that's how we, uh, that, that was our uh, experience with that. So basically for each track, because in-band event messages can be in each CMAF track. So you have to scan each of the CMAF track for event messages and filter out the data and put it in the manifest if you're creating a manifest and so on. So, so that was our consideration for that. Great. Uh, we have uh, another question from, uh... Uh, Abedak, uh, what are the requirements that we need on CDN or edge side to support CMAF ingest and maintain low latency in ranges of one to two seconds? Is there any impact on CDN of CDN on end-to-end -end latency? Yeah, well, so there one to two is quite challenging to achieve with HTTP streaming. So typically for HTTP streaming, we aim to target so to reach parity with broadcast. We aim for three to four or five seconds and then typically for the cdn part we use http chunk transfer coding so basically in the tool there are two options for sending cmaf content one is a chunk transfer base so basically a long running post where you basically don't have a fixed content length header set so the receiver must then actively process the stream to detect basically the segment boundaries and so on and do this they call it cte uh, CTE. So basically your receiver on the fly is receiving the segments and on the fly is generating the, the, the content. That's, that's the architecture that's being proposed for, for low latency streaming uh, in the Dash industry forum, but I believe also in, in, in the HLS uh, specifications. But it doesn't go really, unless you have a real true optimized setup with very, very small chunks, uh, maybe you can reach under two seconds, but that was not what we were, were targeting with, with uh, the low latency use case that, that we tested. So mainly it's ATP chunk transfer coding and then some processing in the origin server to, to do this continuous transferring of the data. So if you just only post the segments, like segment by segment with fixed content length and maybe a separate manifest, then your CDN node can be relatively dumb. It just stores all the segments and, and the, the manifest. But for CMAF ingest, typically we don't use the manifest. So we just only use the, the CMAF tracks which have enough information to allow us to generate the manifest on the fly. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, the other question we will get it, you will get it offline uh, over Slack maybe, or whatever platform you want to use. Uh, so um, uh, let me uh, go back to the presentation mode. Uh, okay. Is. So, our seventh paper is going to be presented by Miguel, uh, and it's uh, is from uh, University of Côte d'Azur, and he's going to talk about uh, uh, unified evaluation framework for head motion prediction methods in 360 degree videos. I'm very interested in this. Okay. 
So can you hear me there? Yes. It's fine. If you want, you can share also your screen. Otherwise. OK, I will share it uh, later. So okay. first, I will introduce uh, briefly. Uh, so OK, thank you, Luca, first of all, for the introduction. And uh, so I will introduce the, the our work first. So given the, the, the acute need for head motion prediction in 360-degree uh, video streaming, there have been a number of uh, recent approaches that have been proposed to exploit the knowledge of the past uh, positions and uh, of the 360-degree video content to periodically predict the next positions over a given time horizon. So we can find uh, different works that are published uh, in uh, NOSDAP, in ChinaCom, in ACM Multimedia, in PAMI, CBPR, uh, with data sets uh, published in MMCs, for example. And uh, some of these works have uh, similar evaluation metrics or even use the same data set. But uh, none of them compares with their counterparts that aim, aim at the exact same prediction horizon or, uh, or that have the exact same prediction problem. And here our goal is to address the strong need for uh, uh, comparison of uh, existing approaches on uh, common grounds. So for this reason, our uh, main contribution in this work is a framework that allows the, the researchers uh, to study the performance of their new head motion prediction methods when compared with existing approaches on the same evaluation settings. That means on the same data set, on the same prediction horizon, and using the same test metrics as described in the original works. So our goal is to contribute in the re reproducibility of the test in this regard and to progress towards uh, more efficient 360-degree video streaming uh, systems. So the entire material, that is the code, the data sets, the neural network weights, and the documentation is available in our GitLab uh, repository. So now we'll share uh, my screen. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing that I, I want to show you is, um, is the, um, the um, from, from our repository is the, the functions that we use to make the structures of the data set uh, uniform. So we have this file utils.py. Uh, uh, in this file, we provide different functions to perform uh, the transformations that are needed uh, from these uh, heterogeneous uh, data sets. So each of these data sets that we consider have, has a particular format and a particular schema. So some of these data sets, for, for example, uh, we have the data set of uh, PAMI 18, where uh, they use uh, language specific formats. Uh, in this case of PAMI 18, they use a MATLAB file to store the data set. Or we have the case of uh, MM18, where they store the, the data in a Python uh, dictionary. So in, in our repository, we provide the code to parse each of these data sets and set all the traces of all the data sets as uh, 3D vectors. So, um, uh, here in this part, uh, we, we provide the, the, the way to, to, to parse and sample the data sets as uh, 3D points in the unit sphere, and we sample them uh, to, to make them uniform at the same rate of 5 hertz. So, um, we could plot, uh, in this case, the subsampled uh, traces just to verify that the subsampling is uh, correctly done. Uh, and uh, here, for example, on the left, we show the original trace. Uh, means this is in the case of PAMI 18, but we did the same for all the data sets. In the right, we showed the subsampled trace. And here we can see that after the subsampling, the trace is uh, virtually the same. There is just a few differences but uh, this is due to the subsampling, but still, uh, so this just to verify that our subsampling was correctly done. We also provide ways to, to extract the saliency. So either from the content or from the user statistics. And uh, in the case of the, so here in this figure, we show the, in the middle one, is the, is the saliency based on the user statistics and that we call it in our paper, uh, the ground truth saliency map. And we call it like this because it's the ground truth signal that is used to train most of the saliency, uh, saliency map predictor algorithms. And we also provide content-based saliency maps 
that are based on the model of PanoSal net, where we simply extract the saliency from each video frame using this, uh, this deep uh, neural network to use to, to extract the saliency map from the content. Finally, we also provide ways to, to evaluate and train the, the different, uh, so in this case, in this uh, file, we provide a way to train different models on specific uh, settings. And also we provide another, another file to evaluate the different methods on uh, different test beds. So we give the details of uh, each experiment in the repository and also in our paper. But for example, if you want to compare uh, simple baselines or even a new method with these uh, existing works, we can use the same metrics, the same data sets and the same prediction horizons for it. So in this case, if we run, uh, we can we can uh, we can make the comparison of the of the result results reported in these works with, for example, in this case, uh, um, two two baselines, a no motion baseline that assumes that the user will not move during the entire prediction horizon, and uh, observe that we use the same uh, prediction horizon that is used in the works. Like for example, in MM18, the prediction horizon goes from uh, 0 0.5 to 2.5 seconds. We use the same metric that in this case is the accuracy that is defined as the intersection over union and uh, and we use the the same data set um, so we can we can compare uh, the two baselines for example that uh, uh, that we use to we we can compare it against the the reported results of uh, mm18 and we can do the same thing for uh, for example pami 18 so in our repository, the results uh, that we provide, uh, the format changes according to the, to the uh, experiment that we analyze. For, so for example, in the case of PAMI 18, they, they provide a table. So we also provide a table with the, with the same metric to use. Finally, for the case of uh, CVPR 18, Sorry. when we compare Sorry, Miguel, it. I, I guess yes. we are just a little bit over time. So you okay, so can wrap I'll up. finish. Um, so we can even compare with, uh, with new data sets and, and new test beds. Uh, finally, I want to say the last thing is uh, that in the entire material is available in our GitLab repository and we will be continuously updating it. So now I'm open for some questions. Don't hesitate to leave the questions in the Okay, in the so I think that we, at the time we don't save, have the uh, time for, a question maybe you can uh, so there is a question uh, for, from Laura Tony you can maybe uh, chat over Slack yes because uh, we we have the the last speaker uh, let me uh, get back to presentation mode okay share screen and that's it so we have the last paper so uh, low latency streaming and multi DRM uh, with Dash JS uh, is the last uh, talk and it's going to be delivered by Daniel. So please, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can share your screen if you need. Thanks, uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Perfect. Um, so I realize I'm standing be between you and your virtual beer, so I'm keeping it short. Um, so our paper is called Low Latency Streaming and Multi-DRM with Dash.js. Um, I prepared one slide on Dash.js for everyone who is not aware what Dash.js is. Um, Dash.js is an open source Dash client, pretty much an implementation um, by the Dash Industry Forum. Um, Dash Industry Forum is a consortium of different companies to, uh, which actually have to go to promote the adoption of MPEG Dash. Um, Dash AF includes companies like Microsoft, Akamai, um, Google. So um, pretty big names in there. Um, as I said, Dash is the reference client of the Dash Industry Forum. Um, it's written in JavaScript and it makes use of the MSE and EME. Um, so those are two W3C um, browser extensions. Um, so Dash runs on HPlot platform, which uh, pretty much supports MSE and EME. 
Um, DashJS has various features in place. Um, ABR switching is one of them, but we also have different um, implementations of the uh, Dash IF IOP guidelines. Um, whenever you want to exchange something in DashJS, um, you're more than welcome to do that, um, as I said. Right now, we have different ABR algorithms in place, um, mainly based on throughput, drop frames, and buffer level rules, um, but this is all replaceable. So DashJS can be used as a foundation for your own player or um, use it in production as it is. Um, the current DashJS client works on all major browsers, uh, including Chrome, IE11, Edge browser, Safari, Firefox, and also the new Chrome Your Match. Um, it's available on GitHub as an open source project, and it also has a tight integration with the Dash IF test vector database. So whenever something is added to the uh, test vector database, this is also reflected in the client itself. And um, for this short demo, I want to highlight two specific points. First thing is that we have a sample page in place, which pretty much covers everything Dash.js is capable of doing. Um, so this ranges from just plain VOD dash playback to live playback, um, conversion from smooth streaming to MPEG dash, support for thumbnails, DRM, multi-period, um, captioning, uh, subtitles. So everything Dash.js is capable of doing, um, you find that on the sample page and you can try it out yourself and even use that um, for your own implementation. Um, for this short demo, I would also like to highlight one of the specific aspects I'm covering in the paper, which is low latency streaming. So um, for this, we have set up a small demo page where we actually use CMOF low latency chunks um, with a segment duration of eight seconds and CMOF, dura uh, sorry, ch chunk duration of one second in order to showcase a low latency playback. So if I refresh this page now, um, you should see that the stream loads. My Wi-Fi is sufficient. And I'm turning off the audio. Um, so what we can see in this case is that, as I said, we have eight second segments and one second chunks, and we are playing at a live latency of three seconds. Um, and what you can do in DashJS now is you can also adjust this live latency. So we can even switch down to two seconds. And you can see down here, the buffer level is around two seconds. The latency should decrease at some point and go down to two seconds if I click on apply now. Um, always keep in mind that the buffer level is a trade-off with the latency. So whenever you decrease the latency, the buffer level will always decrease as well. So if I put in like one second here, um, we pretty much end in a scenario where the buffer level might not be sufficient and we end up with small stalling um, in the live streaming session. But um, this is something DashJS can do right now. So when you have your CMAP or latency stream, you can use DashJS as your player and you can try out different target latency and also define different catch up playback rates as well as min drifts uh, in order to keep this latency. Um, so everyone who is interested in DashJS and Dash uh, development itself, um, feel free to check out the player. Also, if you made changes to the player, feel free to contribute them on GitHub. Um, we are more than happy to welcome new contributions. Thank you. Great, thanks. So we have time for one quick question. Uh, here it is. So is by Jean. Uh, how is the UTC synchronization between Dash JS and, and server achieved, especially if no UTC time in the scripture, descriptor is present in the MPD? Yeah, so um, as you point out, thanks for the question. Um, usually you should have like a UTC timing element in the MPD. I think this is also mandatory by the new IOP uh, guidelines. If that's not present, um, we use an Akamai time source um, as a fallback. And you also have the possibility to use the date header when you do a manifest request um, as some kind of uh, reference timing. But that's like really the last hope um, if there's no UTC timing available, or timing element. Okay. so I. Guess that uh, Ali is just Ali's question is just a comment, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you check out my background, there's Ali on it. I'm sorry, yeah. the orange yeah, I guy. See, I see that. I see. I see. I see Ali. He was younger. <laughs> but that's like two years ago. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> just kidding. So thank you very much for sharing your work. Uh, so let me get back and uh, to close the session. So uh, thank you very much, everyone who uh, have, has participated to uh, this uh, very exciting uh, session. And uh, 
we will get back here uh, basically now, I guess, or in some some minutes. Uh, so a, a short break, and then we will have um, the trivia session. So maybe uh, Laura, if you are here, you can take over. Uh, or yeah, 